Uh, all right, here we go. So um, our aim today, so the first aim is to derive the so-called motivic wall crossing formula for quiver moduli spaces. And then I would like to give you a sample application to uh, gromov witten invariants. And um, so that's the overview over the content of the talk. We first uh, discuss the change of stability, namely recall from um, the last talk on, on Monday that to define the moduli spaces of stable representations, we have to make a choice, a choice of a stability function, which in general is uncanonical. And um, this looks like a drawback of the theory, but we'll see today that it is really a very nice feature and that this uh, leads to some, some strong and unexpected things. So that's why we discuss this change of stability in, in detail. Then we'll have another look at the harder narrow simon recursion, which I also briefly uh, explained on Monday at the end of the talk. From this, we will, in the first uh, third part, derive this wall crossing formula. And then in the fourth part, I will show you some uh, application and the principle uh, behind deriving such uh, applications. But to start, uh, let me summarize the, the previous talk. So um, just to, to recall the notation and just to, to see that we are all on the, on the same point before continuing. So as always, we work with a finite quiver. We fix a dimension vector for, for this. And we fix all the time a stability function, which was just the linear function on z to the q0. q0 is just the, <clears throat> the vertices of the quiver. Associated to the stability, we had a slope function. And with the aid of the slope function, we could define the notion of semi-stability, of stability and of Pauli stability. Yeah, to just briefly recall it, semi-stability means uh, the slope of any proper non-zero sub-representation is uh, less than or equal the slope of the representation itself. All right, and uh, then we formulated the following theorem. So first part is there exists a complex algebraic variety, which we denote by MD theta SST of Q which parameterizes the isomorphism classes of the theta polystable representations of the quiver Q of dimension vector D. And we have seen on Monday that this uh, isomorphism classes of theta polystable representations is in perfect analogy with the situation we considered last week of parameterizing semi-simple representations. And we saw that there are good reasons that we cannot get better than parameterizing the semi-simple representations or here polystable representations because geometric invariant theory is only able to parameterize closed orbits. All right, so um, yes. So first of all, this variety exists and we produced it by considering the approach of a certain ring of semi-invariants. These semi-invariants will actually not again uh, appear today. So I omitted this part. But we now look at the structural properties of the varieties which we get. Yeah. So I mean, <laughs> our first aim, uh, going back to the motivation last week, our first aim is somehow fulfilled. We started with hard linear algebra problems, and we wanted to define spaces, moduli spaces, encoding all the continuous parameters in this classification problem. And now we succeeded with this. We defined these algebraic varieties. And in some sense, you could say, okay, we're finished. Yeah, we solved the linear algebra problem in, in some way because we defined these moduli spaces which encode all the continuous parameters in the classification problem. Uh, that would be the easy solution. But of course, it is more interesting to now really start analyzing the geometry of these moduli spaces uh, with the hope of getting back to the original, say, linear algebra problem. Yeah, so that's why we continue at all. Okay, so what do we know about these complex algebraic varieties? Um, as I already said uh, on Monday, there are always irreducible normal varieties, and we know the dimension. It's given by the same formula in the semi, as in the semi-simple case, one minus sum over all di squared plus sum over all the arrows di dj. This is some of the expected dimension, and it's the actual dimension if there exists a theta stable representation of dimension vector d. There are actually several uh, ways to, to, uh, to check this condition of existence of a single stable representation. 
One way is to uh, just look at your specific situation. If you are uh, interested in a specific class of moduli spaces, from this concrete situation, you may just uh, have an ad hoc proof for existence of stable representations. That's usually a good idea. There exists a general solution to existence of stable representations, but uh, this solution is highly recursive. So it's purely numerical in terms of uh, the quiver and the dimension vector, but it is of a highly recursive nature. So my advice is, if you look at a concrete class of quiver moduli spaces, you better try to find an ad hoc way of constructing a stable representation instead of uh, trying these uh, general criteria. All right, what else was the content of the main theorem last time? Uh, we had a, a map which comes from the definition as of the moduli space as approach, where we map from this moduli space parameterizing the semi stables to the moduli space we introduced uh, last week the moduli space of semi simples. You always have a canonical map from there to there. And it is always a projective morphism of algebraic varieties. And remember, this moduli space of semi-simples was affine. So this clarifies uh, where these moduli spaces are placed in quasi-projective varieties. It is always projective over the affine moduli space of semi-simples. And uh, as a little corollary to just this sentence, um, think about the situation where Q is acyclic. The situation of an acyclic quiver, that was the problem last week, where we don't have oriented cycles. And so these moduli spaces of semi-simples reduce to a single point. Now, imagine this is a single, uh, single point. Then you have a projective morphism to a single point, which means this thing itself is a projective variety. Yeah? So as a corollary to this general description, if you have an acyclic quiver, then this moduli space of semi-stables is always a projective variety, which is nice. And uh, OK, final part of the theorem from Monday. There are coordinates, some more natural coordinates for these moduli spaces given by appropriate determinants which you can build, uh, determinants of block matrices which you can build out of your quiver representations. So in principle, you have a way to coordinatize all these moduli spaces, but it is really only in principle. Uh, there are very, very few situations where you can actually use this coordinatization effectively. Yeah. So just as a quick example, uh, even if you consider something like dimension vector 2, 3 for the three arrow Kronecker quiver, um, it's very, very difficult to actually coordinatize the moduli space, although the moduli space is a mm, rather well understood six dimensional variety. All right. Okay. So, yeah. So that summarizes what we achieved on, on Monday. Let's continue <clears throat> to um, today's topic of wall crossing. I, th I think that was chapter four of my series, wall crossing. And we start today, we start now with the question change of stability. How does the moduli space change qualitatively when changing the stability theta? And qualitatively means its qualities as a as a geometric object, its qualities as an algebraic variety. This is part one of, of today's talk. And later, we will ask about how it changes quantitatively. So for example, how cohomology changes, of, how cohomology of this moduli space changes when changing the stability. But let's first, let's first look at it qualitatively. And I will summarize several results on, on, on this slide. Um, but first, I have to set up some notation. So we fix a, a dimension vector D all the time. And uh, we call stability space uh, just Z of, to the Q0, or, or better, better, it's dual. So that's where the stabilities live. And inside the stability space, I will define certain hyperplanes, certain walls. This contains finitely many walls, hyperplanes, namely the stabilities where the slope of a subrepresentation is the same as the slope of uh, the slope of a subdimension vector is the same as the slope of d for all potential dimension vectors of subrepresentation. Yeah, so z to the q zero. Um, I, I did some uh, 
I did a little mistake because I treated theta as a function on ZQ0. So let me quickly identify ZQ to the Q0 with its dual for the purposes of this. So um, for any dimension vector, which is less than or equal D, except zero and D itself, we consider a certain hyperplane in the space of possible stabilities, namely those uh, stabilities where the slope of E equals the slope of D. So imagine this in the plane. The plane is then divided uh, into uh, several chambers by these hyperplanes, which are then just lines through the origin. So this induces a decomposition of ZQ0 into chambers. If I want, uh, want to make this formal, I better first um, work with a real vector space. Inside this real vector space, I consider hyperplanes. And then I take the closures of the components in the complement of the hyperplane. And then again, I pass to lattice points. But um, I wanted to avoid these uh, technicalities. So just imagine Z to the Q0 as, as some lattice in which you have hyperplanes. And the regions between the hyperplanes, these are the chambers. And these are the chambers in stability space. And uh, using this terminology of chambers, we can now formulate a theorem with uh, several results in it. So first theorem is why we introduce these chambers. The moduli space does not change if you change your theta in the interior of one of these chambers. Yeah. So if you take a generic theta, which is not on a wall, but an inside one of in the interior of one of the chambers, and you just perturb it a little bit, the moduli space does not change. And this is actually easy to prove because under such a very small perturbation, actually the set of semi-stable points, so the notion of semi-stability itself does not change. And so the moduli space does not change. So what you actually get is you only have finitely many possible moduli spaces for any given dimension vector because you have finitely many chambers here for a fixed, for a fixed quiver and a fixed dimension vector. So that's the first part. Um, so there's another very special feature if theta, your stability, is in the interior of a chamber. Let's additionally assume, this is an assumption which I already mentioned in the uh, question session or in the talk on Monday. Let's assume that the dimension vector is indivisible, which just means that the entries uh, of the dimension vector have no uh, common divisor. And let's assume that theta is sufficiently generic. So theta in the interior, which means avoiding all these finitely many hyperplanes. In this case, we find that the moduli space is actually smooth. It's a smooth variety. And as I already told you on, on Monday at the end of the talk, uh, this is why quivers are quivers with re uh, out relations are much, much better behaved than quivers with relations with respect to moduli spaces, because generically you get smooth algebraic varieties, which, for example, for cohomological um, consideration is uh, much more well-behaved. All right. So what about stabilities, which are not on the, in the interior of a chamber? What if your stability lies on a wall? So let me assume again that D is indivisible. And let me assume you pick the wrong theta. You pick a theta zero, which lies on one of these walls then you can slightly deform it away from the wall and deform it into the interior of a chamber. Yeah? And what you then get is a canonical map from the moduli space for the deformed stability to the moduli space for the original uh, stability. And under very mild um, restrictions, which I somewhat encoded in the notion of a deformation, what you get here is always a resolution of singularities. Um, because here, the moduli space on the left, it's in the interior of a chamber, so it's something smooth. For a th stability on a wall, we cannot guarantee this, so this is usually singular, but the natural map which you get is actually a resolution of the singularities under some mild uh, technical assumptions. And this is very nice because it's actually a very nice source of resolutions of singularities. And uh, moreover, 
This resolution of singularities is often a so-called small resolution. This often, again, encodes some um, technicalities, which I don't want to uh, explain in detail at the moment. It is often a small resolution. So what does this mean? So smallness in particular implies the following formula. So let me first read the formula and then explain it. So here on the left-hand side, you have the cohomology compactly supported cohomology of the moduli space of theta semi-stables. And on the right-hand side, you have the compactly supported intersection homology of the moduli space of theta zero semi-stables. So let's analyze this and <coughs> go back to the previous slide. So theta zero is a, is a stability which is somehow bad because it's on a wall. For this, you usually get a singular moduli space. Theta is a deformation of that, so it's a nice stability in the interior of a chamber for which you get a smooth moduli space. So, and here on the left-hand side, you have this nice smooth moduli space, and you can consider its cohomology. So this is actually singular cohomology with rational coefficients, and the C means compactly supported. It is only relevant in the case uh, where your quiver has cycles. So in first approximation, forget about this. So here you have cohomology of a nice smooth variety. On the right-hand side, you have a singular variety, the moduli space for the stability on the wall. And for singular varieties, this I already mentioned in the second talk last week, um, usual cohomology is usually very badly behaved. So you better take a cohomology theory called intersection homology. It's a great homology theory, uh, which repairs many of the, of the defects of singular cohomology um, at the cost of being very, very difficult to compute in general. And what this here means is, so here you have a singular variety and you are interested in computing some invariant, topological invariance, intersectional homology. You don't have to compute this difficult thing. You can instead compute cohomology of a much nicer smooth variety using this so-called small resolution of singularities. And uh, so this is a general result on, on quiver moduli spaces and you can apply it to very, very small quivers and small dimension vectors and you get interesting classes of, of spaces for which you can quite easily compute intersection cohomology by cohomology of some uh, different very nice variety. So that's one typical application of somehow changing the stability. Yeah. So this is maybe nothing we ask for a priori, but this is the first uh, benefit of having this space of stabilities in which we can freely move. Um, it gives us, for example, such small resolutions of singularities, and uh, this it gives us uh, classes where we can actually compute intersection cohomology. All right. And final part of the theorem. There is something called the canonical stability, and I wrote it down here. So the canonical stability is given by, at the vertex i, you take the sum over all the dj for j pointing to i minus the sum over dj from i pointing to j. So uh, at the moment, this formula somehow comes out of nowhere, but it is related to a, to a theorem of, of Schofield on sure representation, on existence of sure representations of curves. And with the aid of this canonical stability, under some mild additional assumptions, you can prove the following. So quite often, the moduli space for this canonical stability is a Fano variety. And this is nice because Fano varieties are among the uh, most special projective, smooth projective varieties. They behave much more rigid than arbitrary project, smooth projective varieties. So uh, this is also one of the advantages of changing the stability. There is a certain canonical stability for which you have a Fano variety. And then you can start of, to somehow move your theta and stability space and get more complicated varieties if you want to. All right. So yeah, this sums up um, some of the properties of qualitative properties of the moduli space when you somehow change the stability a little bit. Um, 
So maybe is this already a good point for, for having a short break with questions? Uh, if you're halfway through your material, sure. Because No. <laughs> okay, <laughs> then yet. you can go ahead. It, it... Okay, let, let me continue with, with one more slide. Okay, so um, yes. Okay, so the guiding question for this slide was, how does this moduli space change qualitatively when changing the stability theta? And now we will turn to a quantitative analysis of this change. We will look at some quantitative invariants of these moduli spaces. And this is related to the harden arasimov recursion. And um, so what are these quantitative invariants of, of moduli spaces, which I want to analyze? So one invariant could be a very basic topological invariant, just its Euler characteristic. Or it could be the Betty numbers in singular cohomology. Or it could be counting points over finite fields, arithmetic invariants, and so on and so on. And somehow the universal place where you can uh, compute very nice invariants of algebraic varieties is uh, motifs, the so-called Grotendieck ring of varieties. Uh, so quite often in, 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 in talks, introductory talks, I try to avoid this, uh, these definitions because they are a bit technical. But I think this is uh, the right place to do it. So let's forget about quiver moduli spaces for a few minutes and just consider a marvelous gadget called the Grotendieck ring of varieties. The Grotendieck ring of, of varieties and actually of complex varieties. So varieties just always means for us quasi-projective varieties. So let me introduce this object. So as usual, the Grotendieck ring of a category is uh, a free abelian group in all objects in the category, and then you mod out certain relations. So in an abelian category, you mod out by short exact sequences. Now we are uh, in the category of quasi-projective varieties. There's nothing like short exact sequences. It's far from abelian, but we can nevertheless simulate this uh, construction of the Grotendieck group. So first of all, we take a free abelian group in all isomorphism classes of complex quasi-projective algebraic varieties. This is giant. Okay, but now we mod out a relation, namely the so-called beautiful name cut and paste relation. And the cut and paste relation means we mod out by the relation a variety x equals the sum of u and x minus u whenever u in x is an open subset. So we somehow simulate the usual definition of, the, of a Grotendieck group for an abelian category by claiming exact sequences are something like triples consisting of uh, an open subset, the whole thing, and the closed complement. Yeah? So here is the open part, and here is then the closed complement. And whenever we have such an exact sequence, we say that in this Grotendieck group, we define x as u plus the closed complement. Yeah, so we're taking a, a giant abelian group, but then we are modding out many, many relations. And I will show you a sample uh, com computation at the end of, of the slide. All right. And this gives us uh, an abelian group, this factor group, which is uh, still much too big to understand. But anyway, it's somehow the right place to, uh, to do some computations. We define a multiplication because we want a Grotendieck ring by saying that the product of classes X and Y is just the class of the product. Yeah? So just as a sample uh, for this, it means that if to compute the motive of affine n-dimensional space, uh, this is the same as the nth power of the motive of the affine line, because affine space is just the n-fold power of the affine line. Yeah? So this is the multiplication. We define one special element in this Grotendieck ring, which is traditionally called the Lefschetz motif. And this Lefschetz motif is just the class of the affine line. Yeah, that's the first thing uh, apart from a single point, which you can think of. OK. So and now this will be somehow the coefficient ring. This Grotendieck ring of varieties will somehow be the coefficient ring for all the computations which we will do in the following, except that this is not completely true. Uh, we need some more flexibility. 
So we consider the following localization of it, which I will always now, uh, in the field, uh, from now on call R mod. So the ring of localized motives. We consider this Grotendieck ring of varieties, whatever it is. And we adjoin some additional elements. Namely, we want a half power of L. So we want to have a formal square root of the affine line, which definitely doesn't exist. A square root of the affine line would be a variety whose uh, product with itself is isomorphic to the affine line. This doesn't exist. But uh, well, for some reasons, it's good to have it. And also, we want to make this affine line invertible. That's why I put a plus minus here. Yeah? So I want to be able to invert by the affine line. And I also want to be able to invert expressions 1 minus L to the N for all N. So this is actually the Grotendieck ring of a certain class of quotient stacks for uh, experts. But at the moment, let's just view it as a very strange coefficient ring. But this is the ring uh, in which we will compute. So every variety X has a class in this R mod. And it's this class which we want to actually calculate in, in uh, many examples. So why consider this ring? So let me, let me look at one very basic invariant of, of algebraic varieties, namely the Euler characteristic. Euler, more precisely, the Euler characteristic in compactly supported cohomology. The Euler characteristic in compactly supported cohomology is actually an invariant of varieties which fulfills this cut and paste relation. Yeah? The Euler characteristic of X equals the Euler characteristic compactly supported of an open part plus the closed complement. And it is multiplicative with respect to products of varieties and so on. So that means if we do a computation in this ring of motives, we can actually recover the Euler characteristic from this by just specializing variables. Yeah? Uh, well, this uh, might look a bit unfamiliar compared to other, say, topological invariants of moduli spaces, but we will come back to this. But this is some of the right coefficient ring. This, these are, so every variety has a class in here, and it is a concrete invariant of a variety which we want to compute for the moduli spaces, and not only compute, but also uh, see how it changes when changing the stability. Let me do one sample calculation. So what about projective n space? Well, projective n space admits a principal open set where the first homogeneous coordinate is non-zero. And this principal home, uh, open set is isomorphic to affine n space. And the complement to this is uh, all the points in projective space where the first coordinate is zero, this is projective space in one dimension smaller. Yeah? So this is the structure of projective space, which we learn in a, in a basic course on algebraic geometry. And this in particular means you can apply the cut and paste relation here inductively, and then you can compute the motive of Pn as one plus Lefschetz motive, so motive of the affine line, plus square of Lefschetz plus plus Lefschetz to the n, because L to the n is just the motive of affine n space. Yeah? So the motive of projective n space can be written as a polynomial in this motive of the affine line. And in fact, this polynomial, uh, we can also write as a truncated geometric series. This may look a bit arbitrary, but this is somehow a hint why in our localization, we want to be able to write something like one minus L in the denominators because it's just uh, very flexible to, to use. Yeah, so this is, uh, this is the Grotendieck ring of varieties with a sample calculation. And okay, so maybe this is a good point to, uh, to have the five minute break. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Marcus. Um, so Jens had a question. Jens, you can ask your question now if you want to. I just wanted to quickly ask, uh, so in this associated map from the semi-stable to the semi-simple moduli uh, space, yeah. what is the induced map? What do you, uh, which kind of uh, semi-simple representation do you associate? Yeah. To, uh, 
Okay, so, um, ah, okay, it was even an earlier slide. Right, so geometrically, this map uh, has the following interpretation. We define this moduli space as the spec of a ring of invariance, and this as the approach of a ring of semi-invariance. Yeah, and there's always a natural map from the approach of a graded ring to the spec of its zero part. And that's where this comes from geometrically. Mm -hmm. And representation theoretically, uh, theoretically, it means the following. Take a semi-stable representation, V, take its associated graded with respect to any jordan hölder filtration. Mm. And that's it. Yeah. OK, I see. But there was and also this other filtration, which where the associated graded were stable. How yes. are those related to each other? Uh, so first of all, the, this idea comes again here in this resolution of singularities. If you take a representation here, so a semi-stable representation for the stability theta, then you can take its associated graded, but now with respect to a relative jordan hölder filtration for this other stability, theta zero, and that again defines this map. And apart from these jordan hölder filtrations, there's also this hardener simon filtration, and to, to this we will come in a few minutes. That's a Thank you so story. much. Okay. There was another question by uh, Monica Garcia, and she asks, is there a canonical way to deform MD theta? To deform the moduli space? Ha uh -huh. I, um, no, I, I, no, <laughs> there isn't. And actually I would really like to, to know and namely, this refers to this uh, to this last uh, theorem here. This is quite recent work from this year. So, for this canonical choice of stability, quite often this moduli space is is Fano. And it seems that in in all the examples which we can compute, the Fano uh, varieties which we get are rigid or infinitesimally rigid. So first cohomology of the tangent bundle vanishes, which means there's no hope to deform them to anything else. Yeah, so uh, it might even be true that at least in this special situation, there is no canonical deformation of them. So I don't know. <laughs> uh, I also have a question about the Fano-ness. So here you assume Q to be a cyclic or is there a notion of Fano which makes sense um, okay, no, this this is this is hidden in the often. <laughs> ah, okay. I assume Q to be acyclic, so it really should be <coughs> a smooth projective variety. And uh, only in this case, I can talk about Fano. Okay, and then there is one final question uh, by Simon Van yeah. Is he going to ask the question? Yeah, as I, I can ask. Yeah, uh, sure. Go ahead, Simon. You... Yes, please. Uh, could you could you could you please uh, say uh, a little more on, on the, uh, for the condition under which the, this resolution is small? Yes. So um, so first of all, um, theta zero should be on a wall. Theta should be a deformation in the sense that it is in the interior of a chamber, so you deform away from a wall. And then the additional assumption for smallness is that. Um, <coughs> that if you restrict the Euler form of the quiver to those dimension vectors of a fixed slope for this, for this uh, stability, then this Euler form becomes symmetric. Yeah, so this is a certain genericity assumption which uh, will appear um, as, as one of the first assumptions in, in the final talk tomorrow. And tomorrow I can explain the role of this, yeah. so. Uh, it's, it's always the condition that for the dimension vectors of a certain fixed slopes on, on, on this sub lattice, the, the Euler form should be symmetric. But this happens quite often for many very interesting classes of, of quivers, although there are counterexamples. And for this classes, we get this uh, smallness. Oh, and can, can I also, this, this also seems to suggest that the cohomology is the same on both sides of the, of the wall in this case. Yes, actually, then under this assumption, uh, you have you, you have the same cohomology on both sides of the wall, although the moduli spaces might be non-isomorphic. Yes. Okay. Fair. 
Yeah. Thanks. So so actually, uh, Hans Franzen and I wrote a paper about a very, very particular curve of moduli space where uh, we looked at this situation. We had a stability on the wall and two different ways to, uh, to deform it to a stability on the chamber. And so the cohomology is the same, but we showed that the ring structures in cohomology are non-isomorphic, which is a very subtle thing. Yeah. So the ring the cohomology is, is the same, but the ring structure of cohomology is different on the two sides of the wall. Okay, I think that was it for uh, the okay. question session now. So we can continue whenever you're ready. Okay, let me continue. So we looked at this gadget called the Gottenig ring of varieties. And that's the place where some of invariants of our varieties live, uh, of our moduli spaces live. And now we want to compute them. And uh, now I will show you that this computation of the motives of moduli spaces just follows somehow formally from the existence of the hardener Simon filtration, which we introduced on, on Monday. So let me repeat it. Every representation V admits a unique filtration such that all the sub quotients are theta semi-stable and such the slopes of the sub quotients are decreasing. Yeah, that was this uh, wonderful Hardener similar uh, filtration and the, the very nice thing about it is that it is unique as a filtration and can even be made functorial, functorially depending on the, on the representation. So now this fact, just this bare fact we want to translate to to motives and that's the following theorem now uh, here's a formula which um, looks difficult but now we will analyze it so this is a formula in this localized Grotendieck ring of motives so here on the left side we take the whole representation variety and take its motive and divide by the motive of the base change group, which acts. So this left-hand side is something you can actually easily compute. So um, recall that this representation space, Rd of Q, that was just a vector space. And the motive of a vector space is just a certain power of the motive of the affine line. So that's easy to compute. The motive of GD is also easy to compute because, well, the, notif uh, the motive of GL, of the group GL, is known and is also just a a polynomial in this left shed's motive. So this left-hand side is something very easy and known. And on the right-hand side, you first get a sum over all decompositions of D into a, sub, a tuple of dimension vectors E1 plus ES, such that the slopes are decreasing. And if you compare this to the uh, harder narrow simon filtration, well, this decreasing slopes of sub-representations so of course, reminiscent of this decreasing slope condition for the subfactors in the hardener error simul filtration. So then in this sum, which is actually a finite sum because you only have finitely many decompositions of a dimensional vector, you have some power of, uh, of this left shed's motive, which is just some basic variable. And the something is not important, it's a long expression, but it is not important at the moment, so I, I omitted it. And then you take the product over factors which are similar to the factors here, but now it's only these factors for the set of semi-stable points. Okay, so that looks a bit difficult, but uh, it's actually just, I mean, it's just formally equivalent to the existence and uniqueness of this harder error sim filtration. If you carefully translate it to, to this language of motives, then this is just equivalent. Okay, so why would we be interested in, in, in such a formula? And I will simplify this formula for you later on. So second part of the theorem, if your dimension vector D is indivisible and the theta is sufficiently generic, these are two con conditions which we have seen or, um, uh, on another slide. These are the conditions ensuring that the moduli space is a smooth variety, right? D is indivisible and theta is generic in the sense that it's in the interior of a chamber. So that gives smooth moduli spaces. And in this case, this complicated motive, this quotient of the motive of semi-stable points by the group up to some little factor L minus one is the motive 
of the moduli space. Okay, and uh, now I will tell you why, why this is uh, exciting news. So we want to compute the motive, so the class in this Grotendieck-Ringer varieties of the moduli space. And we want to, well, we can do this in the case where the moduli space is smooth. So D is indivisible and theta is sufficiently generic. And in this case, this motive is this quotient. And this quotient is an expression appearing here. Okay, here on this right-hand side. And if you take the sum over all the things on the right-hand side, you get this motive, which is somehow quite trivial to calculate. So what this gives us is actually a recursive way of computing the motive of a moduli space from very simple things, namely these things here on the left-hand side. And after performing this recursive calculation, what you get is that this motive is actually something encoding all the Betty numbers of these moduli spaces. Namely, what I wrote down here is the Poincaré polynomial of the moduli space, but specialized to the variable L. Okay, so I would really like to, to show you a sample computation of this and really write down this recursion, but this usually takes quite a long time. But um, let me just um, tell you that the motives and Betty numbers of such moduli spaces can now be determined recursively. And um, you can really write, although this might look not, uh, not being so easy, you can actually write a, a very uh, short computer program for computing Betty numbers of, of moduli spaces with the aid of, of this formula. Yeah? So again, the logic is we do a calculation in this Grotendieck ring of varieties where every variety has a certain class. And we can compute this motive as a quotient of motive of semi-stable points by the group. These motive of semi-stable points divided by the motive of the group appears here on the right-hand side. And these things on the right-hand side, they sum up to something very explicit here on the left-hand side. And then one can somehow rec resolve this recursion. And um, so actually my, my computer program for uh, computing these Betty numbers is less than uh, 10 lines of Maple code and runs in uh, Maple 5 in an ancient version. And uh, so this is actually a very simple formula for computing uh, invariance of, of these moduli spaces. And all this is really just formally equivalent to the existence of this hardener Simmons filtration. Okay, so if you don't like such big formulas, I will uh, rewrite it for you as a very, very short formula on the next slide. Just look again at the ingredients. Here on the left-hand side, you have this, the total space, all representations. And here you have a huge sum over products of contributions just from semi-stables. Yeah, so this is the essence of the formula, apart from all motivic details. And now let's reformulate this as the wall crossing formula. Again, unfortunately, I need a bit of notation. Uh, if you are into quivers, then you uh, maybe missed this notation for uh, in, in all the lectures so far. The Euler form of a quiver representation. It's a non-symmetric bilinear form on dimension vectors, which is defined by this formula. DE is the sum over all i, diei minus the sum of all arrows, di, dj. And it's actually the homological Euler form for, for curve representations. Uh, what we need about this Euler form is not itself, but it's so-called anti-symmetrization. So we just uh, anti-symmetrize the, the Euler form, ge minus ed. So for, for those of you who are into uh, three Calabi-Yau setups, um, the Euler, homological Euler form for a three Calabi-Yau category is automatically anti-symmetric because you have this Calabi-Yau duality between zero and three and one and, and, and two in cohomology. And uh, this is not true for the quiver setup. So we somehow uh, anti-symmetrize the, the Euler form brute force to somehow simulate the three Calabi-Yau situation. Okay. so. Using this anti-symmetrized Euler form, we define uh, 
yet another ring called the motivic quantum torus. It has nothing to do with the torus, that's just somehow historically the right name. So here's the ring. It's a ring whose, uh, it's a ring of formal power series in as many variables ti as you have vertices in your quivers, in your quiver. And the, the coefficient ring of this formal power series is this ring of motive, yeah? So the coefficients in these infinite series in, power, in products of the TI is motives of varieties. That's pretty big, but um, well, so far the motives we have seen are polynomials in L in the left shits motive. So this is actually in all, in all situations is rather harmless. So this is a ring. And on this ring, we define a slightly twisted multiplication. So in the usual polynomial ring or formal power series ring, you would multiply monomials t to the d, t to the e, as t to the d plus e. So that it would just be the monoid ring of, uh, of the monoid dimension vectors. Here we introduce a slight twist. Think quantum groups. Everything is slightly twisted. We twist with the aid of this anti-symmetric Euler form. And what we twist is minus, one, uh, minus the square root of the Lefschetz motive. That's a very technical thing. And I really would like to avoid it, but I can't avoid it because otherwise all the formulas are wrong. Yeah. So this, although it looks complicated, so why do you take minus square root of the motive of the affine line? That's one of the essential features of, of all this theory. And so that's the reason why I really have to introduce this, although it might look very complicated. Yeah? So if you have ever seen quantum groups or quantum deformation of well-known things, you can always think of L or L one half being the quantum parameter Q, but the minus sign is also essential here. So that's something we just have to accept, although it looks a bit complicated. Okay, so now we have a very complicated ring of formal power series. And in this ring of formal power series, we will now look at a certain element. Namely, we'll look at certain generating series. And here's the first generating series. Again, it doesn't look very nice, but I will analyze it for you. The element AQ. So I will define an element AQ in this motivic ring TQ. And I just realized I forgot a monomial in here. So there should be a monomial T to the D here. I will correct this in the slides. Sorry for that. So these quotients, the motive of the representation space divided by the motive of the group. These quotients we have seen in our um, Hardin error Simon recursion. And now we take all these things together, again, slightly twisted. We sum up over all possible dimension vectors, non zero, and add a one. So this is a, it's a formal power series with constant term one. And on the other side of our Harden error semi recursion. Let me quickly go back to this Harden error semi recursion. Here we go. So that was the Harden error semi recursion. On the left hand side, we had this quotient of representation space by group. And on the right hand side, we had quotient of semi stable representations by the group. And this motivates to not only look at this function, but also on this function. So this is the function aq, it's a formal power series summing up all these. And here's a formal power series summing up everything relative to a, flick, uh, to, a, to a fixed slope of representations. So this sum here formally has the same structure of this as this sum, except that we only look at the motors of semi-stable representations. And we sum only over those dimension vectors where the slope function assumes a fixed value. All right, with the aid of, of these generating functions, we can now formulate the motivic wall crossing formula. And here it is. And now it looks much nicer than this Harden error Simon recursion from the slide before. The motivic wall crossing formula just says, this formal series summing up all the quotient motives is the product over these local variants. It's a product over all the rationals in, in, in decreasing order. Yeah. So this is just what you have to remind about all this hard and error similar recursion things. We just 
have a, a certain function a, which is a function encoding all representations, and we factor it into a huge infinite product, an ordered product over the rationals of functions encoding all the semi-stable representations. This is a function in the motivic quantum torus. Okay, so uh, before continuing, let me uh, again summarize some of the, the logic of, of what we developed. Let me go back a few slides for this because the logic is a bit non-trivial. So first step in our logic was we want to look at quantitative properties of moduli spaces, so certain quantitative invariants, and we want to see how they behave uh, with respect to the stability. So the ring in which we can study these invariants is this Gurtendieck ring of varieties, the classes of varieties, modulo cut and paste relations. Okay, and then we saw that the hardened RSM infiltration has a formal consequence, namely that we can somehow relate in some formula, something which contains all representations to something which only contains semi-stable representations. And this something is actually, in good situations, it is just actually the motive of this moduli space, this invariant which we want to calculate. Now, this formula doesn't look particularly nice, but we can make it look nice if we consider this gadget motivic quantum torus, a huge ring of formal power series, and pass to generating functions. And the language of generating functions, we just see that the sum over motives of all representations can be written as a huge product over sums just counting semi-stable representations. And that's the essence of this, of a wall crossing formula. So final thing to notice, why is this called a wall crossing formula? Well, this left-hand side of this equality here, this AQ, that's a function related to all representations. That's clearly independent of the stability theta. But the right-hand side here involves the stability, the chosen stability theta, because here we are looking at motives of loci of semi-stable, theta semi-stable representations. But since this infinite product is AQ, which is independent, this theory in particular tells us the right-hand side if is independent of the stability. So what this means ultimately, and this is what uh, is usually called wall crossing, for any individual representations or the individual moduli spaces might change dramatically when you change your stability theta through a wall and stability space. Remember, inside a particular chamber and stability space, the moduli space stays the same. But if you change your theta through a wall, the moduli space changes. There goes some very complicated birational transformation. So any individual moduli space changes. But if you take the product over all these generating series encoding the moduli spaces, then this product is actually independent of the stability. Um, this might just look as a, as a funny little side remark at the moment, but it is really essential for many of the applications of quiver moduli spaces. And uh, in the remaining time, uh, I will somehow leave this level of abstraction which we, which we have obtained here and go back to a very concrete situation and show you one sample application of such wall crossing formulas. Um, the problem is that most of these applications of wall crossing formulas are also um, involve some heavy notation like, like this already does. So let me uh, go to some very uh, basic application. The drawback is you will not see that it is an application of this wall crossing formula. You just have to believe me for a moment. Okay, anyway, so here's the principle for applying wall crossing formulas. So what we have here in the wall crossing formula is a factorization of one series into a product of many series in some, <coughs> in some complicated ring called this motivic quantum torus. The funny thing is that factorization formulas in quantum tori appear in many other areas of mathematics. So for example, they appear 
when you look at quantum dialogarithm identities, which we will do tomorrow. It appears in the uh, tropical vertex formalism in gromov witten theory. This will be the topic of today. This was developed by gross pandere siebert It also appears in the, all the scattering diagram formalism of gross hacking kiel and maybe in many, many other areas. So there are many other areas where you have uh, very complicated factorization formulas in quantum toric. And now the principle for uh, finding great research projects is, if you can match such a factorization formula in a quantum torus, if you can match it to this quiver wall causing formula, and uh, here I would like to remark that this matching is usually what is 90% of the research project, then quiver moduli spaces can compute interesting and very non-trivial invariants for you. Yeah, so you just browse through the literature on many things. And if you discover some strange factorization formula in a quantum torus, then you better have a look at whether this can be matched to the quiver wall causing formula, and then you can prove a non-trivial result. All right, let's see a sample application. And the sample application is to gromov witten theory, although I don't have to formalize, formally uh, tell you about gromov witten invariants. So, let me come back to one example, which I omitted in my talk uh, on Monday. I originally wanted to do this example, but then I, I skipped it. Let's consider the so-called M subspace quiver. It has M vertices I1 to IM pointing to a central vertex J. And the dimension vector we consider is very simple. We just put the entry one here on the lower row and an arbitrary entry D here on top. Let me choose the following stability. This is not so important at the moment. Just let me note that this is what I call the canonical stability. So in this case, you get Fanover, you might get Fano varieties. And let's see what this moduli space is. All right. So here's what this moduli space is. The left-hand side is our quiver moduli space. So moduli space for this dimension vector this stability, semi-stable representations for this M subspace quivers. And the right-hand side is describing stable configurations of M points in projective space, modular projective similarities. Let's look at this uh, expression here. So we take projective space of dimension D minus one. We take M tuples of it. So we take M points in projective D minus one space. And we take certain stable configurations. And as I explained on Monday, while well, you always have to perform a stability analysis and understand what stability for your quiver representation means. Well, it's a, I will not go into this because we don't need it here. So you're parameterizing stable configurations of M points modulo the natural symmetry group of projective space. Namely, the natural symmetry group of projective space is projective similarity, so the group PGLD which acts simultaneously on this point configuration set. All right. So this is a very basic moduli space. It's just points in project configurations of points in projective space, but um, it encodes lots of information. And that's what I want to convince you about now. So let me first summarize the geometric properties. Again, we have some assumption, namely you have the assumption that the that D and M have no common divisor except one. This is this assumption of indivisibility of a dimension vector somehow. Yeah? So under this uh, assumption, this uh, configuration space is a smooth, projective, rational, Fano variety of dimension D minus one and minus D minus one. So that means we get a series of very nice Fano varieties of known dimension whenever D and M are co-prime. Um, well, this series of moduli spaces was known long before uh, quiver moduli spaces. In fact, these moduli spaces of point configurations in projective space are the first example of Mumford's geometric invariant theory if you look at Mumford's book. 
So when he, when he uh, finishes the general theory, he does a first example of moduli spaces of, of GIT quotients, and his first example is point configurations in projective space. Yeah, so this class of varieties dates back to the 1960s, I would say. The surprising thing is that why are all this fancy wall crossing mechanism in motivic quantum tori, one can now and only now realize these innocent uh, configuration spaces encode some very non-trivial gromov witten invariants. And uh, I want to reformulate this now. That's the final slide, I think. Let me define a gromov witten invariant ND. Now, again, you can forget about moduli spaces for a minute and uh, just look how we define gromov witten invariants. So gromov witten invariants are certain enumerative invariants. We want to count objects of algebraic geometry uh, fulfilling certain incidences so that we have something finite to count. So to illustrate this here, I would like to define ND as the number of irreducible rational degree D curves in P2. So that's something very classical in algebraic geometry. It's just curves in P2, yeah? A curve given by an equation of degree D, wonderful. Um, well, this number wouldn't be well defined. Of course, there are infinitely many curves of any given degree in the, in the plane. But we uh, make a finite number out of it by first requiring that this curve passes through 2D minus one given points and they should be somehow in general position. So they should not be on, on some fixed line or so. Again, this is not a finite number. We have to make one more assumption, namely that this rational curve has order D tangency to a given line at a given point. And if you formulate this problem, then working with lots of Chow groups, lots of intersection theory, you can see that this number is actually a well-defined number. Yeah? So posing a problem in enumerative combinatorics always requires as a first step to well pose the problem. You want to count certain geometric objects. If you uh, ask for uh, no conditions, like just rational degree D curves, then you have an infinite count. There's nothing finite to count here. If you require too many conditions, then your count is usually zero. So if I require a degree D curve to pass through, say, a more than 3D points, then usually there is no such curve. But if you do the precisely right amount of, of, of incidences and fixed conditions, then you get a finite count. And uh, so the first step in this art form of enumerative geometry is uh, to well pose the counting problems. And well posing the counting problems usually requires lots of uh, intersection theory. Okay, so, but other people have done the work for us. This is a well posed problem. And uh, this was already considered by Fomin and Michalkin, and they uh, produced some actual counts. So here are these counts. D equals one. Let's look at this D equals one and N D equals one. Uh, why is one the solution to this counting problem? Well, that's actually quite easy to see. So an irreducible rational degree one curve is a line. Perfect. And this line should pass through one point and have order one tangency, which means transversal intersection to a given line at a given point. So for D equals one, this counting problem is how many lines do you find in the plane which pass through one point and intersect a line transversally at a given point? And the answer was even known to Euclid. The answer is one. Okay, what about two? That's also an elementary problem which you can solve by hand. So a rational degree uh, two curve. Well, that's a, a curve given by a quadratic uh, equation. And so you have a, a, a quadric, a quadric in the plane. It should pass through three given points and have simple tangency to a given line at a given point. And if you think about it with just methods from uh, school geometry, you will see that 
quad rigs passing through three given points and having simple tangency to a given line at a given point are uniquely determined by this. So you get a one here. This entry seven here is already quite different because you're looking at cubics through five given points and having order three tangency to a given line. It's not so easy to see that this is seven, but this is how the line continues. All right. And uh, okay, so back to quiver moduli. As one application of all this uh, wall crossing formulas, here's a theorem. This very difficult number of uh, this difficult count of rational degree D curves is given by a very simple geometric invariant, namely just chi, the topological Euler characteristic of the moduli space of 2D minus one points in projective space of dimension D minus one. So this is one of the moduli spaces for the subspace quiver. And in particular, these numerical parameters dm are just now d 2d minus 1. And the Euler characteristic of this innocent looking space knows these difficult gromov witten invariants. And for this equality, there is no geometric or elementary proof. The only known proof is going through uh, lots and lots of, of wall crossing. And uh, this is quite fascinating because when I found this, I thought there should really be an elementary proof for it, but apparently uh, there isn't. Yeah. So this this equality of of a geometric and a topological invariant can only be found through lots of uh, wall crossing for motivic invariants. And uh, this ends the talk. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Marcus. Uh, let's clap for Marcus. Unfortunately, there is no. Uh actual audience who can do this for us now. Here it is, here right. it is. <laughs> um, so there's one question uh, by Monica Garcia and I will uh, read it for you. So she asks about the hardener Rassiman recursion formula. Yes. And uh, does this translate to a formula for the stack of representations? Yes, actually, um, I, I just wanted to avoid stacks. So what this actually means is you take the quotient stack of the representation space by the group GD and take the motive of the stack. And here on, on the right hand side, the same. Yeah? So this quotient of motives is actually the motive of the quotient stack. That's it. I can then ask a follow up question on this. Oh, wait, maybe. So in, on the second line, you have D indivisible and theta generic. Is this enough to ensure that there exists a semi-stable representation so that this moduli space um, is what it's supposed to be? Or can you ah, remove, okay. or working with stacks, can you remove the condition maybe? Um, so, so what this condition here means is that um, any semi-stable is automatically stable. We don't know if there is a semi-stable. If there isn't, the moduli space is empty and its motive is zero, but that's fine. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But as soon as there is a, a semi-stable, it's automatically stable. And that means the quotient, the quotient map of the semi-stable locus by the group is a geometric quotient. Yeah? So the quotient stack, essentially, apart from this factor, the quotient stack is isomorphic to the quotient space. Mm -hmm. That's why you have this equality. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? Feel free to unmute yourself and maybe say your name. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, go ahead, Jens. I heard okay, you. Uh, yeah, so I'm Jens. First of all, thank you for the talk. Uh, and uh, so I wanted to ask if this theorem, which is on the slide right now, if there's a categorification for this theorem where instead of working in K0, you would do it in some kind of uh, triangulated category of motives or something like this. Ah. Um, there is a categorification of this theorem where instead of, uh, of motives, you consider, well, there's some version of this where here you write down some um, equivariant cohomology group. So here write down equivariant cohomology, here write down equivariant cohomology, you replace the product by a tensor and the sum mm -hmm. by a by a direct sum, and then it's more or less true. So we can really categorify it to to equivariant cohomology groups 
or if you want cohomology of the quotient stacks or chow groups of the quotient stacks. Um, yes, and th this this is the content of, of what one usually does with the cohomological Hall algebra. Yeah, so in the okay. co the cohomological Hall algebra is a is a tool for categorifying such identities. And mm -hmm. I hope I will find time to explain this tomorrow. Okay, but not the motivic version of it, just the cohomological, basically. Yeah, yeah, just cohomology. No, I, I don't know about about the oh, triangular category of motives. Okay. Oh, that, that's 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 a very good question. Um, so, yeah, maybe we should discuss this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so there are not too many ingredients which you need here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you need some some nice equivariant theory. So it's not really about cohomology. You need some nice equivariant theory where you have. Um, um, you only need a few ingredients, so maybe it even works with motives. Mm, because I mean, you can also do motives on stacks if the group is not too terrible. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. I, mean, the, I yeah, guess yeah. the stacks here are harmless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so and then you, know, you have the localization discuss. sequence and so on. Yeah, maybe. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, and then I think Kave also has a question. So Kave, feel free to unmute yourself. Yes, uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, as a comment to slash question regarding this theorem and whether or not we in fact have a weight theta for which the stability condition is non-empty, I'm yeah. inclined to believe that King actually gives us a relatively full answer saying that as long as D is indivisible, then such a theta would give you a non-empty non stability condition if and only if it's a sure root. Exactly, uh, exactly, yes. yes. So that we have a relatively easy to always find out something generic for which the stability condition is non-empty. Right, right. I mean, it, it, it can be, so existence of a, of a stable or semi-stable can really, uh, can be decided numerically just in terms of the quiver, the dimension vector, and the stability. But usually, all these numerical criteria are of a recursive nature. Yeah, I mean, if if you use this this uh, criterion of of Alistair that you have a stable representation, even only if you have a sure root, you can prove sureness of a root uh, recursively by Schofield's theorem. And the only problem is that all these criteria are recursive. And if you really want to do this in concrete examples, then the recursions are extremely heavy. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But yes, I mean, everything can be decided numerically, purely numerically. OK, thank you, Marcus. Um, and then uh, Sasha Minitz also has a question. And I think he will yeah. unmute himself now. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, my question is, um, can um, can both crossing formula be upgraded to tell something about like the ring structure of cohomology groups? Or uh, I don't think so. <laughs> so I I have no idea how to how to bring the ring structure into into the game. Well, the the problem is maybe that I mean. So if, if you look at this line, yeah. So this quotient actually makes sense when you are in the indivisible and generic situation, yeah. Then this quotient motive is actually the motive of the moduli space, yeah. And so in all the intermediate steps, you have these these quotients which uh, do not make much sense. And I cannot imagine that you can somehow upgrade everything to the ring structure. You don't look convinced, so maybe there is such an no, 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 I, I, no, I have no idea. W would be great, but uh, uh, I mean, the, the approach to uh, to studying the ring structure of these moduli spaces in the indivisible and generic situation um, is completely different. Yeah. So I mean, they are described by generate by explicit generators and explicit uh, relations uh, in a paper of Hans Franzen. Namely, uh, as generators, you can always take a uh, churn classes of, um, of tautological bundles. And the relations are somehow also of a tautological nature. So the first relations you can guess are defining relations, in a sense. 
Um, but this is a completely different way of uh, computing these, uh, uh, of computing the ring structure. Uh, and now I have to say this is not really true because in the so-called, in the cohomological Hall algebra, you can really, um, uh, okay, no, but, but still I would say the answer is no. So one cannot upgrade the Hutton error simon thing to, to something giving the ring structure. The ring structure is of a bit different nature, but it is known. Yeah, thank you. And may maybe also a quick follow-up question, which is, yes, so uh, there, was, there was this example of, um, of you and um, Hans. Yes, right. Uh, uh, that um, like across the wall, you have the same cohomology groups, but like different ring structure. Yeah, like, it was exactly here. Yeah, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you have so is it um, like does it fit into some like that? Like does it what, what does it tell us like this this fact? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I, I I can tell you what what it tells us. So um, what I illustrated with this with this thing here is that um, okay. So sometimes you can compute intersection homology by just computing homology. But this doesn't upgrade to the ring structure. In particular, this means if you can interpret the intersection homology in two different ways as cohomology of something, and the ring structure in cohomology is different, then you cannot have any canonical ring structure on intersection homology. Yeah? And this is something which was already noted by Goreski in um, shortly after, the, um, after establishing intersection homology. Goreski showed there is no uh, natural ring structure on intersection homology. And he illustrated, uh, uh, he proved this in the same way of writing down a variety with two different uh, small resolutions of singularities with non isomorphic cohomology rings. But um, this example is never worked, was never worked out in detail, actually. Yeah? So I, I just found it as a, as a little remark in the, sim, uh, in the seminar. Uh, series by Borel, in the Borel seminar on intersection homology, but there was no actual proof for this. And uh, we were just looking for an alternative proof of this fact. So what, what this gives us is actually uh, a proof that intersection homology of these moduli spaces cannot have a natural ring structure. That was the motivation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Marcus. And then there's a question by Lucas. Lucas, feel free to unmute uh, Yes, yourself. so in the first part, you had uh, you introduced those maps between the moduli spaces for certain theta, the wall crossing. Yes. Uh, I was wondering, do we get something corresponding in the representation category of the quiver? So like blocks and translation functors. And if we do get something like that, do they categorify something interesting when we take uh -huh. the group? No, I think on the... On the level of the representation categories, this is much more simple-minded than anything resembling blocks of category or whatever. Yeah. So what you're really taking is you're taking a semi-simple, semi-stable representation here, and then uh, if you take this representation v, and instead of of theta stability, you look at theta zero stability, then this v might collapse into smaller factors, and you just take the direct sum of all these smaller factors. Okay. So it's, it's much more naive. I, it, it really feels different, yeah. Okay, thanks. And then there's a question by Ian. Feel free to unmute yourself, Ian. Sure. Uh, yeah, so I, I question uh, about, um, let's see, on the page with the L to the something, uh, you, were, you were there. Yes, yeah, right, <laughs> the L to the something. <clears throat> yeah, here we go. So does the L to the something, uh, does it have to do with the, the ex possible extensions between the yes, uh, right. semi-stable? I, exactly. I see. And, and it's kind of surprising, at least to me, uh, I'm, I'm new at this, that um, the dimensions of the uh, ex like extension spaces don't change when you move around in the moduli space. Yes. Yeah, you, you, yeah, you grasp precisely the very important point, point about this formula. OK, so, so, so let me explain. So. Uh, Every representation V admits a unique Harden error sim infiltration. The subfactors are, are semi stables. So, how far is the V uh, 
different from, from just these subfactors? Well, to recover the V from the subfactors, you also need the extension datum of how you build up the representation V from the isomorphism classes of the, of the subfactors. Yeah? And if you look at this wall crossing formula, here you have the V, here you have the subfactors, and here we encode all this, all this extension data, yeah? the way in which these subfactors are extended to build the representation V. And it is indeed surprising that, this, uh, that the freedom of choice in, in, in this extension datum just behaves like a vector space. Yeah? L to something means it's just the, mo uh, the motive of a vector space. And the reason for that is precisely because our category is hereditary. Yeah, so that's another point while it's very, in, uh, it's very important to work with quivers without relations. If you work with quivers with quite arbitrary relations, then you would never get L to the something here, but just some complicated motive of a space of iterated extensions, which you can never control. Yeah. Yeah, uh, thanks. Yeah, so it's, it's really a feature of, being, uh, of the quiver being hereditary. There are some very special situations for two Calabiao, three Calabiao categories, where you can also control this, where you have a similar wall crossing formula. Yeah, but this, this seems to be special to low dimensional Calabiao situations. Yeah. I see. And, and the L to the something, it, can it be computed by this Euler form? It, yeah, yeah. The, the something okay. is, is just a sum of, of Euler forms of these, uh, between these uh, E1 to ES. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thanks a lot. Welcome. Uh, okay, I think those were the questions uh, that uh, were supposed to be asked publicly. So let's thank uh, Marcus again uh, for thanks, the Marcus. wonderful talk and the wonderful answers. I will now stop the recording.